Hello, and welcome to Answer Everywhere. This is an improvised live show where every week we take a look at a code repository and peek around and try to see what makes it work. Today, we're taking a look at Redis, which is everyone's favorite cache or in-memory database or distributed key value store, however you want to consider it. So I think Redis is actually fairly simple. Um, I haven't used it myself, uh, certainly not in production, uh, but if you have, maybe you can uh, let me know as things go, if, I, if I'm missing something important. And hello, hello to Omar Tarek. It's good to see you here. And um, so, <laughs> thanks my man. So Redis is, um, I think is gonna be really simple. The, the basic idea is that we want to have something like a dictionary, um, like a Python dict hash table, uh, call it different things depending on the language you're coming from. But we want to have that essentially as a service and we want to be able to, and, um, and I'm being told that OBS is disconnecting. Let me tend to this for a moment. Okay, so it looks like we're re reconnected. Um, there will be an API for calling into the hash table, putting things, getting things, adding things to list, those sorts of things. Um, a lot of people uh, call Redis, um, it, consider Redis to be a general database, which I think it, it can kind of work as, but I don't think we'll see a lot of the things that we saw when we were looking at databases like Postgres. So I think we'll see some version of transactions, um, but uh, durability is not like the primary goal of Redis. Durability meaning that your data <laughs> lives after your server dies or whatever. Um, I, I know, I'm aware that there's some, some kind of like write ahead log or since they're not writing, you wouldn't call it a write ahead log, but some sort of append, append log. Um, yeah, but I, I think that given the, the limitations of the feature set, I think it should be fairly simple. Let's take a look and see what we see. Um, we see only a few folders. We have source, which is promising tests and utils depths, which I'm going to assume are, are dependencies. And then the rest of this root folder is just um, things like TLS, MD, well, and security. I guess I'm going to poke at these TLS and security uh, markdown stuff, but um, it doesn't look like there's any real source code in the root folder. And then source has uh, commands and modules and some C files, but not a, not a ton of C files, but not a small amount either. So I'm guessing that this is the um, like the entire implementation kind of in one directory. And um, let me just verify. Yeah, okay. Um, and so let's take a look, since there's only two folders here, let's take a look and see if there's anything extra fun or important in them. Commands and modules. I guess let's look at commands. Commands, I'm seeing JSON, lots of JSON. Asking, off, PG save. Uh, let's look at one of these, maybe cluster, cluster.json. I'm not sure what this is. This seems to be maybe a description of a command, like a, um, a command line command in JSON format. Not, not sure. And then in modules, we have hello stuff. Hello block, hello cluster, hello ACL. I don't know, uh, is this supposed to be like hello world? Here we have hello world.c. Hello.simple is among the simplest commands you can implement. It just returns the currently selected DB ID, a functionality which is missing in Redis. Okay. JSON <laughs> everywhere. All right. So, and then we have security. Just kind of want to see basically what they're, what they say about security. So I can have in mind, um, what sort of, how they imagine you deploying it, which can help as we're trying to read the code to figure out why some things might be the way they are. Um, you build with TLS, you'll need open SSL development libraries. Okay. So they have some open SSL support, which is good. Some stuff about sockets, all socket operations now go through the connection abstraction layer that hides IO and read, write event handling from the caller. And then multi-threading IO is not currently supported for TLS. Um, does this mean that if you're connecting via TLS, you need to be in single threaded mode? The TLS connection needs to do its own manipulation of AE events, which is not thread safe. Okay. Um, AE, I'm not sure what this is. After, after the, after 
the event. Something. AE, uh, here we go. AE e poll. Maybe AE has something to do with e polling. So here's e poll. This is e poll. We've run into e poll a few times. This should be basically the main event loop. This is what we should expect to see. Might as well enter here. This is a good as, as good a starting place as any. AE API state. And I'm not sure what AE is about. They look this up AE Redis. Event library. Let's see. In Redis, what does AE stand for? Almost everywhere, right? No. Asynchronous event. Okay. All right. Um, so asynchronous event. So we have some API state, which has an EPFD, I guess, uh, ePoll file descriptor, probably, and some ePoll events. And we can create this API thingy. We pass it in a event loop pointer, I guess. And it's going to do some stuff like malloc, e call ePoll create, and um, all of that stuff. We can delete events. We can add events and that's about it. Okay. Nothing too super exciting. I guess if AE is, um, is a critical part, then we can look at AE.C. But before we get to AE.C, AE let's look at some of the, um, the names of the files. Bio, who knows what bio could be. Atomic var is presumably for atomic variables. Possibly this is related to um, the version of, uh, of transactions that Redis supports. Um, blocked, maybe something to do with blocking calls. Bit operations is presumably fast bitwise operations that, that might be used for things like um, flags or, or whatnot. CLI commands, the, one of the coolest things that I've seen in like Redis demos that I've watched in the past there. So, um, is the command line looks nice to work with. That's, um, I guess you get command lines with other databases, but it seems nicer than a lot of, uh, databases, which are fairly arch archaic. The CRC 16, I think should be a, um, a, um, CRC should be, uh, the check something. I'm blanking on what it actually stands for. Check something, something. And these I think are used in the, um, in clustering. So, uh, when you, uh, when I asked ChatGPT if Reddit natively supported, um, sharding, it told me it didn't, but it, it, Reddit seems to have some version of, of sharding where essentially it uses a CRC to compute a hash. Um, and it, it takes like the modulus of that hash by some number. And that kind of, that, that determines, um, more or less which replica of the, of the Redis database it goes to. And that's some way of consistently having sharding. Now the details are a little bit, um, a little bit more than that, because what it really does is it has these kind of, uh, tablets or like chunks of, I think what, what they call key slots. And then when you, um, and when you like rebalance your database, instead of moving individual records from one database to another, you move kind of whole chunks of the key space at a time. And that makes it more, less terrible to, um, to like reshard the database, I think. Um, but we'll, we'll probably see some of that, um, as we look in db.c is probably pretty fundamental. In fact, I'm going to grab it and make it the first thing we look at. That might just be the connection. In fact, it's probably just going to be the connection. So it might not be so fundamental, but we might as well look at it. Then we have things like functions. Geo? I don't know. Do they have like geo, geo locking or something? Hyperlog log, which I've heard of. I'm not sure what it is. Hyperlog is, um, could be like growth of some kind of thing that's above, above logarithmic growth. Then I don't know if the second log is supposed to be also a logarithm or if it's like a log. Uh, in the sense of like a written log composed of log functions. I'm not sure. Thanks, man. Would you consider making functions on large or really or any really 
scale systems. Yeah, yeah, sure, I would. I thought about that. I'm not really sure how to do it without like building something. Um, but yeah, we could look at some of the classic um, things like, you know, design, design Reddit and that sort of stuff. Lol what? We have to look at. In fact, it's not only lolwat.h, but also lolwat.c and lolwat5 and 6. Ah, uh, do we need to open all of them? I guess we might as well at least peek at all of them. Yeah, a whiteboard design walkthrough. That would be cool. Sure. Um, that would be great. Um, and then module, I'm guessing is support for mod like plugin modules. Uh, P Q sort. That's a famous sort. I think that's slipping my mind right now. Quick list is presumably some sort of list. Rand, I'm going to guess is random number support. Um, I think the scrolling on my VM is backwards from what my machine is. So I keep scrolling in the wrong direction. I apologize. Uh, racks is given that we also have racks malloc. I'm going to guess racks is related to the racks register. And maybe that's not so important. I don't know what RDB is. I think a lot of these I, uh, I will close pretty quickly once we get to uh, whatever the heart of it is. Rio, I don't know, but I'll open that and the script. And then we have SHA-1 and SHA-2. These should be just interfaces to the, uh, the correspondingly named cryptographic hash algorithms. Although ho hopefully these aren't, um, hopefully these are wrapping a, some other crypto library. And then we have sockets. Um, I, we have a tradition of looking at socket things. You know what? I'm going to see if I can reverse scroll. Yeah. That way I don't make the same mistake over and over again. Okay. And then streaming. I don't know what a spark line is. I guess we might as well look at basically all of this. And then we have T streams. So uh, some of this is just going to be like making things performant. Making it, making it fast to send data uh, to and forth. And some of it is going to be like data structures. I haven't seen anything that looks obviously like a, um, like a key value store or a hash table. Although, uh, yeah, here we go, T hash. Here we go, T hash, T set. In fact, I'm so convinced that these are the data types. That I'm going to pull them into their own, um, their own window. And we're, we're going to look at them here. List, set, stream. And then we'll look at hash.c. I feel like hash is probably the, the root data type. Okay. So we're including just server.h and math.h, which is nothing. That's basically nothing. All right. So we have the hash type API. Check the length of a number of objects and see if we need to convert a list pack to a real hash. Note that we only check string encoded objects as their string length can be queried in constant time. We only check string encoded objects as their string length can be queried in constant time. Well, you're not going to get better than constant. So I assume what this is implying is that other objects take longer to longer to check. Okay, so we have this hash type conversion. You're going to pass it an R obj, whatever an R, R obj is, and another R obj, and a start and an end. And we're going to check this list pack thing. So maybe list pack is more fundamental. I don't know. And we guess that most of the values in the input are unique. So if there are enough arguments, we recreate, we create a precise hash, might over allocate memory. And we're iterating. Hmm. We're iterating over something. So far, no. We're checking new fields. New field server. So if um. Okay. So we're computing this new fields thing, which is a size from the um, the difference between the end and the start. Actually, it's halfway. And then we're checking whether it's bigger than the max list pack entries. In which case, we. If it is bigger, then we do type conversion using whatever object encoding HT is. And then we call dict expand. Not sure what that does. 
but maybe, we, maybe you'll see more in the future. And then, and then we do an iteration. We check whether SDS encoded object of the argv. And um, do some size computations, check length, etc. Here's hash type get from list pack. Get the value from a list pack encoded hash, identified by field, returns negative one when the field cannot be found. Okay, so these are these are interesting and all, but I'd like to see if I can find um, what uh, the actual implementation. These look like helper methods so far. Higher level function of hash type get that returns the hash value associated with a specified field. The hash value. Um, I'm not sure if hash value here means like um, the uh, the object that's stored by the key or just the uh, like the index to look up. All right, and we've got more of this encoding stuff, object encoding list pack. And we're checking lots of encodings. So we're, whatever we're doing, we're doing something with encoding. And it seems like relatively custom. We can get value object, like hash type get value, but returns a Redis object, which is useful for interaction with a hash type outside t hash c. OK. So let's, let's poke along. This is tz set. Z sets are ordered sets using two data structures to hold the same elements in order to get O, log n, insert, and remove operations into a sorted data structure. OK, so we want a sorted data structure. And um, we don't want to take too long to insert or remove. And so um, I guess naively, if we, if we just have one structure, then um, because they have to, it has to be sorted, Typically, I guess either insert or remove would involve finding where in the structure th the thing goes. Is that what might take longer than we wanted to? I'm not sure. And at any rate, but at any rate, at any rate, um, by using two data structures, uh, we can get we can get the performance we want if we if um, yeah. The elements added are added to a hash table mapping Redis objects to scores. At the same time, the elements are added to a skip list mapping scores to Redis objects. OK, so the SDS string representing the element is the same in both the hash table and the skip list in order to save memory. So the two data structures, OK, are a skip list and the hash table. OK, all right. and. The elements are added to the hash table. And at the same time, they're added to the skip list, mapping scores to Redis objects. I'm not sure that I understand what this means the second time I read it. But let's look at a skip list in a, in a moment, because I've forgotten what skip lists are about. Note that the SDS string representing the element is the same in both the hash table and skip list in order to save memory. OK. And this will create a skip list node with a specified number of levels. This will create a new skip list. We can, it looks like this is freeing it, free the specified skip list. OK, let's check out what a skip list is. Skip list is a probabilistic data structure okay, that allows O log n average complexity for search as well as O log n average complexity for insertion within an ordered sequence of n elements. Thus, it can get the best features of any of a sorted array while maintaining a linked list-like data structure that allows insertion. And we build it in layers. Thanks, Jimmy Wales, but no thanks. Um, the bottom layer is an ordinary linked list, and each higher layer acts as an express lane. OK, yeah, this is actually, I think, pretty straightforward. Um, we have a linked list down here, and then somehow, uh, probabilistically, I'm going to move. <laughs> Good afternoon, spam, spam, spam. Oh, <laughs> what? That's see, how did it even get approved in the PR? I don't know. That might have been fast tracked because of its name. Um, OK, so we have this linked list. And then we just do the thing that I mean, I think this is a really natural thing to do, um, which is you're going to start skipping, <laughs> skipping stuff. And then the hard thing to figure out is like, how um, what should you skip? How should you decide what to skip? And how do you do it so that um, you're not like accidentally making things 
worse and worse over time, for example, while it might be really good in the beginning, you can imagine coming up with a scheme that just becomes disastrous over time. And so you need some theory for how to do that. And I, I imagine that's a lot of what skip lists are about. And um, this is probably super interesting and I'll read it later, but let's not dig into it just at the moment. Okay, so, so they're using the skip list for, for what again? For mapping scores to Redis objects. I don't know what a score is. We're having Redis objects to scores. So something's getting scored. I don't know if it's scored in the sense. Let's see if we can find a score. Create a skip list with a specified number of levels. Okay, a score is a double. It seems like maybe it really is a score in the sense of like we're assigning some metric. Um, the score might be S N A N. So I'm not sure multiple elements with the same score that we need. What we need is to find an element with both the right score and object. Okay. So maybe, mm, maybe score is like the, mm, let's ask chat GPT. Let's say in Redis is, what do they call it? Z-list implementation? What is a score? Is that right? I think it was the other browser window. Z-set. Yeah, okay, so it's correcting me. However, uh, in sorted sets, um, it refers to the numeric value associated with each member in the sorted set. A sorted set is similar to a regular set, it assigns a score to each member. Okay, so it's just um, the the thing the 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 metric that we're ordering on, which makes sense for a sorted set. All right, so we've um, we're scoring them, which is really just coming up with their the their like ordinal in the um, in the sorted order, and then we are. Um, look at this again, the hash table. So when we get, when we take an object, we can look up its order essentially in the, in the list, which we'll think of as a linked list for just half a second. And then instead of crawling over the linked list in order, like we know it's index, um, we can't just index into it cause it's not like a vector, for example, or an, or an array. Um, and instead of having to do a linear search for the, for that particular element, let's say it's element like 6,000. We use the skip list to be like, well, let's go to the, you know, suppose we can skip by 1,000. So we go 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. And if it's 6,025, then maybe we do count by tens to get to 20 and then we find five. Something along those lines, I think is what's going on in Zset. And we may come back to these um, types, but I do want to make sure that we cover uh, other parts of the database as well. Um, and then here's the list API. List should just be a, Standard list, right? Do we get any sort of comment? Check the length and size of a number of objects. This is just some, some function comment. Um, quick list nodes exceed limit, etc. List type try conversion raw. Check if the list needs to be converted to appropriate encoding due to growing, shrinking, or other cases. All right, so this is handling um, growing and shrinking, which is part of every list implementation. I'm not sure what is, why well, you might have to change the encoding or even what it's meaning by encoding. List type push, this pushes an element to the specified list object subject at head or tail position. So let's look at the list type push, that should be a relatively straightforward entry into seeing how Redis manipulates the data structures since lists are easy to understand and pushing it onto a list is easy to understand. So we've got a subject and a value and an int, which is where, which I assume just is the index that we're pushing onto. And we check the encoding. Okay, so I was uncertain what encoding referred to before, but one encoding might be quick list. I don't know if this is some sort of list specialization or maybe for small lists. Um, but at any rate, if we are a quick list, 
then we, the position, um, we check whether the where passed in is equal to the head of the list. And if so, we the position is quick list head. Otherwise, it's quick list tail. So this is just, do we want to be on the head or the tail? And then we look at the value encoding. The value is the second thing passed in. And if it's an object encoding int, I guess that's, that might mean it's a list of ints. Then we create this um, car buffer of 32. We call ll2string on the buffer. It, after casting the, the values pointer to a long. And then we call quick list push with the buffer, the string length of the buffer and the position. So this is, um, I guess, essentially encoding the thing uh, that was passed in. And if we're not an int, then we just call quick list push with the value pointer. And what is the difference? Is the difference just that we've converted to a string that we really everything is a string, even ints? Is that the idea? Look at LL2 string. Convert a long long into a string. Returns the number of characters needed to represent the number. Yeah, okay, so we're converting ints to strings. So presumably under the hood, Redis just wants to work with strings, which you can blame them. Um, but if we're down here, we may not be in a quick list. We might be in a list pack. I'm not sure what a list pack is. This could be maybe like a, more like a sparse list. Something that's packed. And we check if, that we, if we are an int and I was glossing over this subject here. We, I didn't mention subject, but I guess um, in Redis, you, uh, you, you like name all the things. So I'm wondering if subject is basically just the name of, um, of the, the like list you're, pointing, you're, you're pushing onto. In fact, let's look at Redis push list and see if we can find some syntax. This maybe? We have our push list one ABC. I think like list one might be the subject is what I'm guessing. Okay. And so we might be an encoding list pack, which is going to have a very slightly different thing where we prepend an integer and append an integer. I'm not sure why I'm more interested in finding out what's going on with list pack. Uh, that's not the definition. Here we go. Maybe here we go. Embedded as a list pack. All right. Well, thank you. Encoded as a list pack, rather. Thank you. But what is a list pack? Maybe this is a general thing. Maybe Maybe we can just do a search for list pack. This looks like a struct. This is promising. Um, we got a comment at the top. A list, oops, a list of strings serialization format. And then we have a specification, which we will take a look at. Not in bookmarks. List pack, work in progress implementation. Um, all right. What is, what is the specification? I guess we can see if this, this header has anything more. What about list pack MD? Since the early stage of Redis development to optimize for low memory usage was an important concern. Yeah, but what's a list? It's some string list, it sounds like, right? That's, that's enough for now. We'll move along. Here's set. Um, set's often implemented, I think, as, a, um, as part of, as based on the hash map, but I'm not sure how they do things here. Do we have any hashes? Factory method to return a set that can hold value. When the object has an integer encodable value, an int set will be returned. Otherwise, the list back or a regular hash table. Okay. So depending on what type you have, you might, the set might actually Im be implemented as a list pack or a hash table. And um, we've got things like max entries, insert stuff, set type add, add the specified SDS value into a set. 
What is SDS? The string thing, simple dynamic strings. The implementation of Redis strings is contained in SDS. Okay, so let's look at SDS next, I guess. Everything seems to be a string, and this seems to be like the heart, the, the lord of the strings. Um, so set type add, we're going to pass it in this SDS string thing and a subject, which I am going to believe for now is just the name of the object, the thing, the set we're adding to. And then we're going to call this auxiliary method. And this is just doing, we've got this temp buffer. And if we're not a string, then I guess we are an int. Oh no, we're just checking if we are an int, in which case we will call int set add, which might under the hood convert to a string. Um, otherwise, if we are a string, then we are down here and we're going to call ll2 string. We saw ll2 int, which converted an into a string. What is ll2 string going to do? Convert something else to a string? Convert a long, oh no, no, we already saw that, long, long to string. Okay. So why are we necessarily a long, long here? Or no, no, maybe I just, I misread where the uh, if statement ends. This, this concludes that and this concludes here. Okay, so yeah, all right. So if we're a string, we're down here. We do a server assert on string. And then we check, we basically do kind of dispatch based on encoding. Um, HT, I don't know what HT is, maybe hash table. We, uh, we check if the set is a hash table or a list pack. And depending on that, we do different things. Oh. I'm sorry, my, uh, my microphone was off for a moment there. Um, so SDS, it looks like is actually a relatively straightforward implementation of string. Um, we have uh, different headers. I'm not sure exactly what's going on in the headers. We have things like the recording, the, the, the data structure will record the length of the string. Um, alloc, I'm not sure exactly what alloc is, but but, we can record flags, and then we have the buffer. And then when we do things like um, call length, then we just do dis we just do a switch statement and um, call the corresponding function. And then we have all the standard string functions like um, concatenate. Uh, I assume this is concatenate, copy, etc. So strings, the relatively straightforward string implementation. And then functions. What's in functions that age? We have this engine struct, which has an engine specific context. And this function to create, to create a function callback, get the engine context and function code engine context. Oh, these are arguments. Um, yeah, create a, so this is just for, this will, is for, uh, we're still in this engine struct, right? So given the engine, I guess we can create a, a callback. Um, we can invoke a function. RCTX is an opaque object from the engine's point of view. Okay, so I guess it doesn't peek inside. You can get the memory, get function overhead, um, that sort of stuff. And we have engine info, including the name of the engine, which is an SDS, the engine itself, and a client. Um, the client would typically be remote, wouldn't it? I'm not sure what it means by client in this case. Uh, then we have function info. It's just holding in various information about the function. Like a pointer to the library that created the function. I'm not sure why they need this in a function description. And then function library info. Um, and we can register an engine and we can look at memories and stuff. I'm not really sure what this function stuff is about. We've got an engine, sorry, this engine stuff is about. We've got an engine and it runs functions. So maybe it's an engine is just a collection of functions that are, um, that operate on the data. Geo is longitude, latitude, dist. Yeah, it's longitude and latitude. It's, uh, structures used inside geo.c in order to represent points and array or points on the earth. So I guess this is for storing, um, what is it like ArcV style data? Uh, I guess you can use Redis to store geographic data. And a geo point is just uh, one, two, three, four doubles. 
and a member, then we have an array, which should be just a collection of points. And whether it's used. And then geohash. Hashing works like this. Divide the world into four buckets. What? How? The world is a sphere. Are these just um, upper hemisphere, lower hemisphere? Okay. And then we're going to interleave lower bits of X and Y. So the bits of X are in the even position and bits of Y are in the odd. X and Y must initially be less than 2 to the 32. And this is from some um, Stanford graphics page on bit hacks. And we can, re so that's the interleaving process. We can reverse the interleaving process. Geohash get coordinate range. So given, um, it does get coordinate range, but it looks like we pass in a range. And we pass in a longitude range and a latitude range. And what? It looks like we are setting max and min to these uh, static constants. These are constraints. So maybe this is just something that you have to, maybe these constants depend on the platform. And that's what this is really about. And then we can encode some stuff. If you give it a range, the long, you give it a longitude and a latitude range, as well as a longitude and latitude, and some step, maybe uh, like how, I don't, maybe like a resolution of the, the, how many steps are between one longitude and the next one. And then, Got this geo hash bits. It's returning an int. I'm not sure if this is an out parameter here, and int is just a code or or what. But it looks like, yeah, it looks like we're setting stuff in hash, and so that this may be an out parameter, and we're returning one on success. Okay, that's kind of cool. Let's pile long hyperlog log. Wait wait wait. Redis hyperlog log probabilistic cardinality approximation. Probabilistic cardinality. Approximation. So we're going to estimate the cardinality of some stuff, presumably stuff that there's a lot of, because it's better, it's easier to 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 estimate the cardinality than to simply count it. And we're going to do it probabilistically, so we're not going to get the exact cardinality. It's based on the following ideas. Before we look at these ideas, let's just check out what a hyperlog log is. Hyperlog log an algorithm for the count distinct problem. Oh yeah. Okay, so we've got some multi-set and calculating the exact cardinality of distinct elements of a multi-set requires an amount of memory proportional to the cardinality, which is impractical for very large data sets. Okay. So we don't want to, um, we don't want to use up all of our memory counting and how do we do it? The observation that the cardinality of a multiset is of uniformly distributed random numbers can be estimated by calculating, calculating the maximum number of leading zeros in the binary representation of each number in the set. Okay. If the maximum number of leading zeros observed is n, the estimate for the number of distinct elements in the set is 2 to the n. Okay, so this is just because of how binary numbers work. Um, and then in the hyperlog log algorithm, a hash function is applied to each element in the original multiset to obtain a multiset of uniformly distributed random numbers with the same cardinality as the original multiset. We're going to apply a hash function to each element, and we get a new multiset of uniformly distributed random numbers. The cardinality of this randomly distributed set can then be estimated using the algorithm above. Okay, so we have this algorithm for. Um, we're estimating the cardinality of things that are uni that are distributed in a nice way, uniformly distributed, um, and we have something that's not uniformly distributed. And so, how do we get to invoke the algorithm? We're going to apply a, a hash function, and for the most part, the output of a su sufficiently well-designed hash function, like a cryptographic hash function, um, will be um, uniformly distributed. And if it's a like a SHA hash function, for example, a, a well 
designed one, then you won't get hash collisions. And so the, um, there will be a, a set isomorphism between your original multi-set and your, and your second. They'll have the same cardinality. Um, it has a large variance. Okay, cool. All right, so that's what hyperlog log is about. And um, given that this should actually be relatively, <laughs> relatively straightforward, although um, the, it, maybe um, the efficiency optimizations make it a little bit more challenging. Whatever HLL is, HLL header, both indents and sparse representation have a 16-byte header as follows. We've got cardinality here, whatever hill is, E and N over U. The first four bytes are a magic string set to the bytes hill. Why? I don't know. E is one byte encoding, currently set to hill dense or hill sparse, and N over U are three not used bytes. Okay. Then the cardinality field is a 64-bit integer stored in little Indian format with the latest cardinality computed that can be reused if the data structure was not modified. All right? And then this is about the, more about representation, et cetera, the sparse representation. This is all really cool. I, I um, invite people to come and look at this. Here's an example. I'm tempted to look at this in detail, but I'm also tempted to, um, I, I want to also see a bunch of other stuff. Um, but we can at least look at some of the code. So this, these are things like mac macros to access the dense representation. And these are, this, this is all going to be like relatively dense. <laughs> use the word that they're using to, to describe the, the matrices. This is all going to be like computations. Um, and hopefully there are lots of tests. This is the sort of thing that, that um, um, humans have a hard time understanding unless they're, uh, have a hard time assuring is correct unless there's lots of, lots of good tests. But I trust them uh, to do that. Here's the lol what. This structure represents our canvas. Drawing functions will take a pointer to a canvas and write on it, write to it. Later, the canvas can be rendered to a string suitable to be printed on the screen using Unicode Braille characters. This represents a very simple generic canvas in order to draw stuff. It's up to each lol what versions to translate what they draw to the screen, depending on the result to accomplish what on earth. Why do they have a canvas in Reddit and why it's not Reddit in Redis and why are they, um, drawing Braille? I have no idea. Maybe this is something we can find on the internet. Redis Braille. How many L's are in Braille? It's just taking me to this file. Let's check out the, uh, the blame. Four years ago, well, what version six, <laughs> refactoring a skeleton, I guess this one, but why? Try chat GPT. In Redis, what is well what? An Easter egg or joke that can be found in Redis. It is not a standard Redis command or functionality, but rather a humorous addition. When you issue the lol what command in Redis, it doesn't perform any useful operation. It says it returns a humorous and often random message or response. Okay. What, what is the humorous response? I don't know. Do we get a list of, um, do we get a list of humorous responses. We get draw a line, draw a square. Oh, this is the, the, um, the PR. Remove blame. I don't see anything that looks like a joke. Maybe it's in one of these other files, like lol what five. 
Daughter, the output of Lol What of Red is Five is a computer graphic art piece generated by George Knees in the 60s. Okay. That's cool. And then here's Lol What 6, presumably Lol What for Red is Six. All right, module. Private data structures used by the module systems. These are data structures that are never exposed to Redis modules. If not as void pointers that have an API, the module can call with them. Okay. So the module has a dict of requested sections, info string, we've collected so far, number of sections we've collected so far, sections of what, I don't know, indication that we're in active section or not. Not sure what a section is or what they're collecting. Here's some allocator stuff. Okay, we have a module context and a get API func pointer. A module key. A Redis key opened with rm open key. We have a we have a context in the database, a key and a value, an iterator, and the opening mode. And some big union of structs. Okay, so the, the union of list, Z set, stream, etc. Okay, and we have some module commands. This struct holds the information about a command registered by a module. So I guess you can register commands. And we have a type for replying. Struct representing a blocked client. We get a pointer to such an object when blocking from modules. Okay. We have an event listener. I'm not sure I see yet how, um, like where the entry points of the module are, but um, let's keep moving along. So I'm assuming this is like quick sort. E, parallel quick sort, support parallel, partial sorting of ranges for Redis. We have a Q sort routine from Bentley and Mick Mickelroy's engineering a, engineering a sort function. So this is like a um, you know a, a, an implementation from from a reference. I assume that's a relatively famous paper. Uh, med three. Med is this like median? We've got swap functions and this underscore pg sort. I'm not sure. I know I positive yeah what p is for but it it seems like it might be partial you have partial we have this whatever this pg sort is we have postgres sure so it's from this is from Net, NetBSD, modified in order to support partial sorting. I, I think this is just probably, the P is probably just for partial. Um, and why partial sorting? Presumably because um, they, very, they rarely need to support, sort the whole range of, of objects in the whole database, I would guess. Here's quick list. Node, quick list, and iterator are the only data structures used currently. The 32-byte struct describing a list pack or a quick list. We saw list packs. Is this the actual implementation? We have previous and next. Um, account of the items and the encoding, which is either raw or LZF, I guess compressed or raw. A container, whether it's plain or packed. Um, whether it was compressed before, whether we, I guess it. There's attempted compressed, but in the comment it says node can't compress, too small. And then whether, you know, don't compress. A quick list is a 40 byte struct on 64 bit systems, describing a quick list. Count is the number of total entries. Length is the number of nodes. Compress is zero if compression is disabled and one, I guess, otherwise. Fill is the user requested fill factor. I guess you can um, ask basically for how, to, how densely to pack it. And 
We really just have head and tail. Where's the, uh, didn't it say that this was a skip list? I don't know, it's just a doubly linked list. List pack is the thing I was thinking of. What was list pack again? I don't remember. Introducing list packs. Yeah, I think I, I think we got here and then I thought it was too much work to figure out what it actually was. It's something related to zip lists. A list pack is encoded to a single linear chunk of memory. It has a fixed length header of six bytes instead of 10 bytes of zip list. The header is followed by the list pack elements. In theory, the data structure does not need any terminator. Was it was just, it's just a list with a header. Okay, seems like a list with a header. All right, so that's a quick list. RDB, something database, remote database. The current RDB version, when the format changes in a way that's no longer backward compatible, this number gets incremented. All right, and then we have some dump file format. And then RDB object types. And those are the things we've seen before, list set, Z hash, Right, sorry, list set, Z set, hash, etc. And the encoded, uh, the encoding stuff, which I think we, we came upon before. Um, I feel like, oh, is RDB just read as DB? Then we have things like list, quick list, Z set, list pack. I guess Z set, list pack. We saw that as set. The underlying data structure could be different, one of which was list pack. So I'm guessing that Z set list pack, for example, means it's a um, a Z set whose backing stores a list pack or vice versa. And you can also have a stream of list packs and some opcode stuff, special RDB opcodes. Things like library function, idle, um, LRU idle time, so least. Uh, least recently used and least frequently used. Idle time for, I guess, um, kicking things out of the cache. Some auxiliary field. And, and some more. Save type. Um, load time. Save type. It's going to take an RDB and a type. Let me turn an int. Maybe I, that's just for saving that the thing that you pass in. All right. And we just look at rdb.h. Here's rio.h. Rio backend functions. Um, I don't know what rio is. Let's look up Redis rio. There's lots of, um, Lots of abbreviations in the source code. A simple stream-oriented IO abstraction that provides a something, a something, a what? Why is it downloading? What are you doing? That provides an interface to write code that can consume produced data using different concrete input and output devices. For instance, the same RDB.C code using the Rio abstraction can be used to read and write the RDB format using in-memory buffers or files. So it's an abstraction over the, essentially the file. Okay, so we can re read, write, and all the sorts of file -y stuff that you can do with either um, a file or, or a memory that's masquerading as a file or whatever. And this is the comment I just read. Why is it in the C file and not the H file? What kind of world are we living in? Okay. Socket.c is, given a lot of the other code we've seen, I, I expect this just to be like socket support. It seems like a, like a lot of the Redis code base is about like custom implementations of things that are presumably fast and robust, but are uh, mostly like analogs of, of functionality that you can find elsewhere. Um, Connection type, CT socket. When a connection is created, we must know its type already. Okay, so we can create a socket. Let's just look at the symbols here. 
we can write we've got some we can have an event handler for the socket and we can have a blocking connection i guess and with to enable tcp no delay so standard standard socket stuff um is it worth poking in no we're about an we're about an hour in so i don't want to dwell too much on this um some of this stuff seems to be not not strictly speaking essential to to thinking about redis as a database um here's a stream Stream item ID at 128-bit number, composed of a milliseconds time and a sequence counter. We've got a time and a sequence counter. And that's the identifier, right? The identifier, wait, okay. So we know what the sequence number is and we know what time it came. I don't know how robust that is as, as an identifier. Uh, for example, is it possible for two machines to have the same stream ID for different objects? I'm not sure. And then a stream itself. Okay, so Rax, I was wrong. Rax is a Radix tree, which is a, a semi-fancy kind of tree, but basically a, basically a tree. Um, we have a Radix tree holding the stream and how many elements there are, the first and last IDs and C groups, consumer groups dictionary. C groups, I'm not sure if this is related to the, the Unix C groups, but it says consumer groups, for example. Um, and it's a dictionary name maps to stream CG. Stream consumer group. We define an iterator. They iterate stream items in an abstract way without caring about the Radix tree plus list pack representation. The iterator is only used inside stream reply with range. Okay. So the stream iterator is like the biggest struct we've seen so far. So it has the stream and a master ID, which is the master entry at list pack head. Count of master fields, entry flags, skip tombstones. Uh, whether to skip the entries that are tombstoned, I guess. Um, a start key and an end key. And a Rax iterator. Because the stream is basically a Rax, a Radix tree. And a, some list pack stuff. How the Radix tree and the list pack interact, I'm <laughs> not really sure. They do in some way. And then a stream CG has a stream ID, which is just the last ID delivered. Um, something keeping track of the entries read. Another Radix tree, pending entries list. This is a Radix tree that has every message delivered to consumers without the no pack option, no ACK option that was not yet acknowledged. So these are things that are, um, this is delivered to consumers, but not yet acknowledged as processed. Okay, so I guess delivered means that we, um, we've gotten some acknowledgement of delivery. Otherwise, it would, probably just say that they was, it was sent to consumers and, um, but not acknowledged as processed. So maybe they, we don't know that they've gotten all of the squeezed, all the juice they need at need to out of these entries. And so we, and so we hold on to them and then we have a stream consumer and, um, all the other stream goodness. All right. A sparkline. What is a sparkline? ASCII sparkline header file. Yeah, this is like a graphic thing, right? Like that, like a graph, a uh, line graph. All right, here's T stream. We looked at all the T stuff. I think we've even looked at T stream. So let's move on. Zip list. I don't think we've looked at zip list. We've looked at so many other lists. Each entry in a zip list is either a string or an integer. We could be a, um, a string or an integer. What makes something a zip list? I'm not sure. Let's see if we can find out. A vector zip list. Yeah. Is this another custom data type? Redis zip list. A specialized data structure used in Redis. Okay. 
efficiently store a sequence of small sized elements such as strings, integers, and floating point numbers. Okay, so another custom data type. Redis is super fond of these, um, these custom data types. Here's DB. This should presumably be like the database connection. It, well, we've got the DB iterator, which has a DB object, a slot, a, uh, the next slot, um, a dict iterator, and a key type. I'm guessing slot is like what we're currently looking at. Next slot is the next thing we're looking at. I'm not sure what exactly is going on with the dictionary. It could be a, a few different things. Iterating across multiple slot specific dictionaries in cluster mode. Okay. This is for cluster mode. I'm not sure what the different dictionaries are. Maybe different, um, they correspond to different nodes. C level DB API. We have things like expire if needed. B is expired, cumulative key count add, DB set value, get dict from iterator, we can pass it in iterator. It just basically returns the dict, right? Isn't this just a field of the, of the iterator? We like check whether it's DB main or whether it expires. And we might return slightly different things. Um, DB iterator next dict returns the next data dictionary from the iterator or null if iteration is complete. So we're going to check um, whether the DB next slot is negative one, which probably means we're done with the iterator. If it is negative one, we return null. Otherwise, we set the D bit slot to the next slot. We set the next slot. We have, so we've basically just incremented the slot here. Now we need to figure out where to get the next slot. And we call, and to get that, we call DB get next non empty slot. And this is probably going to do some kind of search to crawl along to find out where the next entry, the next non empty slot is. Get current slot. We can init an iterator. We can update the LFU. Update the LFU, which is, I believe, least frequently used cache when an object is accessed. Firstly, decrement the counter if the decrement time is reached. Then logarith logarithmically increment the counter and update the access time. Logarithmically. Okay, so um, if the decrement time is reached, we're calling it on a value, right? We're updating a specific value at a time. And so we check its, um, I guess we check this time and, and possibly decrement the counter. Why logarithmically increment the counter? I'm not sure why incrementing a counter is a logarithmic operation. The greater is the current counter value, the less likely is that it gets really incremented. It gets really incremented. So um, if the counter is 255, then we just return 255, we, we, we return the value. Otherwise, we um, get a random number and we subtract uh, the, the, the initial value from the counter to get the base value. We check whether the base value is less than zero, in which case we just zero it out. Then we get this double which we're going to get by dividing one by this uh, base value times the log factor plus one. And this is kind of like a test value. And this is like rolling a die. And if the, um, if the die roll is bigger than our random value, then we increment the counter. Otherwise we just return the counter. So logarithmically increment doesn't mean that the <laughs> increment option, the, the, that the increment operation is logarithmic. It just means that, um, um, I guess we increment it logarithmically often, which is a, a standard sort of thing to do. I just wasn't familiar with it being named in that way. All right. And then we have some stuff like look up, look up a key for read, write operations or return null if the key is not found in the specified DB. This function implements the functionality of look up key read. This looks pretty fundamental. Side effects of calling, calling this function. The key gets expired if it reaches its TTL. The key's last access time is updated. The global key's hit misses stats are updated. And if key space notifications are enabled, a key miss notification is fired. And then you have some flags that you can change the behavior. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to call dbfind 
on the uh, passing the DB object, the key, or rather its pointer and DB main, which is some constant. We're going to set the value to null. Presumably, this is what we're going to return. And if DE, if we have a dictionary entry, we're going to call it dict get val on the dict. And some stuff might happen. We're checking expiry, looking at flags, and expiring if needed. And if we have a value, we'll do updating the access time, et cetera. Otherwise, we'll do more flag stuff and return the value. So aside from the side effects, all this is really doing is calling dict get value, right? In db find. So let's look at db find. You're going to pass it in a db, a key, and a key type. We're going to call it get key slot. Check if the key type is db main. If so, we'll call dict find there. And if it expires, we'll call this expires thing. We're still calling dict find. And what's going on here? Give it a dict. Why is it called ht? I'm not sure. And a key. And just creating some, um, some variables. Check to make sure this is like a sanity check and return, returning null if it's not sane. And um, we're just calling dict hash key to, I guess, I guess hash the key. And we're ending it with a size mask, maybe to just make sure like if our hash is too big, we just truncate it or something along those lines. And then we look up in a, the HT table To get an HE, and while we have an HE, we we call it the dict compare hash keys. So I guess we compare the key, like in the context of the table, maybe with the key that we got from, um, I guess hashing what hashing something. From hashing the key, right? And then um, if this if this comparison is is correct, we just return he. I guess is like the um, the entry hash entry must be what he stands for. Um, otherwise, we just get the next and we just get the next thing in the table. So uh, what we're what we're doing is straightforward. I, I find the um, the um, Naming is just a little bit on the confusing side, but basically we're just uh, taking the key, we are hashing it, um, looking it up in the table to get an entry, to get the first entry, like the first candidate en candidate entry. And if that candidate entry is the one we're looking for, then we return, uh, then we return it. Otherwise we keep looking through the dictionary. Um, okay, so that's straightforward. And then dict next is going to do similar stuff. I don't think we've really seen um, this dict struct, have we? Type def dict. There's a dict entry, which is this double, uh, like array called a table. Uh, uh, um, yeah. And then we have a type and a size, a size mask. Whether you whatever used is in some private data. Okay, so it's basically just a table. And how are we looking at things up in it? We're indexing. Or rather, it's not a table. Is this a uh, well? What I don't know what table is. Let's look at what table is. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, big entry. I mean. A dict entry is a two void stars, a key and a value, and a next thing. Okay. All right. So um, basically, we're taking some void star pointers and putting them into a, a data structure, and the rest of it is like fancy, fancy ways of looking things of looking up um, into that table. And then here's ae.h. A simple event-driven programming library. Originally, I wrote this code for the Jim's event loop. 
Whatever Jim's is, Jim is a, t is a tickle interpreter, but later translated in form of a library for easy reuse. Okay, this is some event loop stuff. All right, and we got things like file events, time events. I guess time events is, uh, is presumably like when something fires, like a, like a clock. Um, and then we have an event loop with some file descriptor stuff, max file descriptors, set size, max number of file descriptors tracked, time event next ID, events, uh, fired events, etc. All right, so event loop, I'm gonna pile along since we're um, pretty long on time. Whatever bio is, background job opcodes. Maybe BIO is background IO. Um, closed files. AOF, I'm not sure what AOF is. But this seems to be background job stuff. Atomic var. Atomic counters using C11 atomic. Blah, blah, blah. Or these various atomic macros. Um, and we have atomic increment, atomic get, and it seems like these are just, um, like wrappers around the macros rather than uh, like an API that uses the atomic functions themselves. Looks like, um, hash collision technique is separate chaining. I'm not sure. If I know what that means, um, separate chaining, a uh, all um, keys that maps the same hash value are kept in a list or bucket. And two, yeah, okay, yeah, this seems to be a thing. So separate chaining, I guess, means that all keys that map to the same hash value are kept in a list or bucket. Yeah, I think this is like this, um, one of the standard things, right? So if you have like, um, two things map to, let's say one, A and B might, might both hash to one, then, um, then you have, um, then you store like, uh, one points to like a list, I guess, that might have A and B. Uh, is that, I think that's, is that what you mean, uh, G Green Manu? And you're, yeah, you're probably right. That's probably what we were looking at um, in, the, in the hash functions because what they were doing was, um, yeah, yeah, when, they, when it was doing that comparison, when it was doing the comparison uh, of the HE value, I think, that, I think that probably is what was going on. Thanks, I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, so block, now we're in block.c, generic support for blocking operations like bulbop and wait. All right, rock on. Thanks, man. All right. Um, block client, set the blocked client. Okay. So, um, where are we? Generic support for blocked, uh, blocking operations like blbop and wait. I don't know what blbop is, blpop rather. Wait is presumably some form of waiting. Block client, set the client blocked flag in the client and set the specified block type B type field to one of blocked macros. Okay, so what are the, uh, block a client for a specific operation type. Once the client blocked flag is set, client query buffer is not longer processed, but accumulated. Um, Master client should so all of a sudden I'm really hungry and, and feeling a little bit lightheaded. So if I, uh, um, <laughs> if I lose track of where I am, that's what's going on. Um, so this is something about blocking. Um, let's see if we can find where BL pop is. I'm not sure. Is BL pop a general thing?
BL pop key. Okay, so this is like a Redis command. Maybe like you would type into the command line. It's a blocking list pop primitive. It is the blocking version of L pop because it blocks the connection when there are no elements to pop from any of the given lists. Okay, so you, I guess it's kind of like waiting for um, a list. I'm not sure what L pop does if there's nothing there. It, maybe it returns some version of null or whatever. But if there's nothing there and you call BL pop, it sounds like it's just going to wait until someone sends um, uh, one of the things down the down the pike. Uh, and this is some the block that see is some support for blocking. We can get blocked type by type. Signal key as ready logic. If the specified key has clients blocked waiting for list pushes, this function will put the key reference into the server.ready keys list. Okay. So I guess we're going to check if anyone's waiting for this. And if they are, we're going to put them here, which presumably does something like announce that they're ready. Um, note that DB ready keys is a hash table that allows us to avoid putting the same key again and again in the list in case of multiple pushes made by a script in the context of multi slash exec. Multi slash exec, I think is the Redis support for transactions or transaction like things. Um, and so this is just going to do something like signal that things are ready to be to be slurped down, it looks like. Okay, so that's blocking. Here's CLI commands, which are interesting, but I'm going to uh, ignore, I'm going to just go past them. Um, and and at any rate, there's not, um, there's not a lot there. Here's C64. This is the header. Presumably they have some sort of Im implementation. Copyright Amazon Web Services. <laughs> Maybe they're using an, an AWS implementation. We're including CRC speed. Um, generated Pi CRC functions. What is Pi CRC? At any rate, these are going to be some CRC functions. Um, No, I want to know what Pi CRC is though. A free CRC source code generator written in Python. So it's going to generate, okay, cyclic redundancy check is what CRC stands for. Um, so this is some Python code that can generate other source code. Maybe it's generated the, um, the C source code. And then CRC is a, is a, like non-cryptographic checksum algorithm, I think. Cyclic redundancy check. An error correcting code, if you will. And so this is, um, if we get a formula. So we, if we CRC the, um, the direct sum of X and Y, which I think for bits is basically just concatenation, if I remember correctly, then we're going to get the CRC of X summed with the CRC of Y summed with C. Where did C come from? I'm not sure. I guess it's a C depends on the length of X and Y. This can be stated as follows, where X and Y have the same length. If you are going to take the sum of X and Y and Z, then you get just the sum of all of them. And we have the semicolon here. As a result, even if the CRC is encrypted with the stream cipher that uses XOR as its combining operation, both the message and the associated CRC can be manipulated without knowledge of the encryption key. All right. So what does that mean? Um, this, uh, this linearity, um, it describes it as affine, although I'm not sure where the affineness comes in. Um, the, essentially this linearity, uh, over, over the CRC means that like if X is the, I guess, encrypted text and Y is the CRC, then, um, we can, um, we can treat them as, we don't need to, to know the decryption of the text, um, in order to, to compute the CRC of the, of the joint thing. Um, and vice versa. So if we, if we have the two separate things, we can combine them. And if we have just the one thing, we can compute it over that one thing and know that the combined, know that the result will be like the correct combined 
thing. And I'm not sure I understand what C is about, uh, but that's, that's, um, would presumably be detailed down here with the implementation. Okay. So that's what CRC is doing. Um, and I think if we can pull up maybe, uh, Redis cluster CRC, maybe we can find a diagram of how like sharding works. How about Redis shard CRC? I'm not finding the diagram I'm looking for. Hash slot versus consistent hashing in Redis. I mean, this is probably interesting, but um, here's a Redis cluster specification. Yep. Okay. So uh, I'll well read this too. The hash slot is going to be the CRC sixteen of the of the key, modulo sixteen three eighty four. Why sixteen three eighty four? I don't know. I don't recognize anything interesting about that number. It's certainly not prime. It has its own GitHub page. Okay, some number. And um. It's probably, it's probably closely related to a power of two somehow, but I'm not sure off the top of my head how. Um, and this is going to give us the hash slot. And then what do we do with the hash slot? Here's the implementation of the hash slot function in Ruby. Look at C because I don't read Ruby. How do you read with all the comments? Read <laughs> the Ruby one. We're going to get the key index. S is the key index. What is this curly brace doing? I don't know. If S, uh, we're going to do this other thing. I don't know what's going on here. Let's, let's actually do read the seat. So we just, these are just variables. We're going to iterate over. Oh, okay. So we're searching for the first occurrence of left curly brace. Why? I'm not sure. Um, and then we find it and we break. And if S is the key length, then we're going to hash the whole key. Um, if we did find a curly brace, a left curly brace, then uh, we check to see if we have the corresponding right curly brace. Presumably, the curly brace syntax separates the some information about the key from some other information. Um, and w somehow we determine what we're actually going to hash, and then we hash it down here, and we end it with sixteen three eighty three. And somehow this is used to figure out which node, um, which node to to go to. Um, but actually, you know what I should look up is Redis, Redis hash slots. That should bring up the right diagram. Redis hash slot. Maybe. Maybe Google Images. I'm not sure. I'll try to find a diagram of it um, and throw it up if I can. Hey, AKH. All right, so that's CRC64. Here's the CRC16 slottable, a table of the shortest possible alphanumeric string that is mapped by Redis CRC16 to any given Redis cluster slot. Okay, so this is, um, we just have a table of things that get mapped into the different slots. So maybe this is just a way of naming the slots by its shortest representative. So it's not slottable, it's slot table. Fair enough. And then here's CRC16, which should be similar to CRC64, except smaller. Now we're back to lol what? Okay. So we've seen lots of stuff. Um, I feel like I don't have a sense of the unity of Redis yet. Um, so let me think a little bit if there's anything I'm missing. We've got, we have ACLs which is going to presumably be access control. Well, you never know. Things in this, in this repo are not always as I expected them to be. We've got a, um, a Redix tree of users, a table mapping usernames to user structures, a 
default user, users to load, the people found in the configuration file, the list, echo log, our security log, the user is able to inspect that using the echo log command. And we have echo category items, which is a struct that has names and flags. And some, got some categories. So like key, I guess these are things that you can set permissions on, like key space, like uh, you can have permission to do various things on a key space. Reading and writing permissions are separate. Set, I'm gonna guess is like setting variable. How's that different from write? I'm not sure. Oh, no, no, set is probably the, um, the set data structure because we have list and hash, string and bitmap and all that sort of stuff. And category slow and category fast. I don't know what those are. Um, and this should just mainly be stuff for like adding things to ACLs, checking that somebody is on an ACL and those sorts of things. So those are ACLs. We, um, everything's in radix trees, I guess, um, where Postgres and other, uh, databases used B trees, it seems like Redis uses radix trees for those. So, um, I thought radix trees were only for like integer objects. Is that true? Radix tree or radix tree or compact prefix tree. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I don't think strings have radices, but they do have prefixes. So if we're going to consider, um, a prefix tree to be a radix tree, then, um, then this is just essentially the same sort of thing. So you have like, um, Romaine will, I guess, be stored R O M A N E. And as you're looking for stuff, you kind of like walk down this tree in the path. Um, um, this gives you some like log like behavior as you're searching for strings. Um, I don't know what the performance of a radix of a string radix tree is. Look up operation determines if a string exists in a try. Are we considering this the same thing as a try? A try is also called a digital tree or prefix tree. And these look pretty similar. All these operations are O of K, where K is the maximum length of all strings in the set. Let's see if there's any other descriptions of radix trees. Let's ask ChatGPT. So tell me about the difference between radix trees and tries. So a try, each node represents a single character or component. Oh, I guess radix just has the, the uh, is that right? A radix tree is a compressed try or compact prefix tree is a tree structure that optimizes space by grouping common prefixes together. Okay. So the difference is just grouping. Um, and I'll ask how does, how do radix trees, how do, how does radix tree performance compare to B tree performance or string data? Um, they can vary depending on the specific use and access patterns. Each data structure has its own strengths and weaknesses. Radix trees are generally faster for exact string matching and prefix searches. The path from the root to the leaf node corresponds directly to the string being searched, resulting in shorter traversal times for exact matches and prefixes. B trees are designed for efficient range queries. Okay, where you need to find a range. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so I guess we're not doing that many range queries for the sorts of things that, uh, that rate that, that Redis is using Radix trees for. In fact, you might guess or speculate that the name Redis might have come originally from Radix somehow. Um, but are we missing anything? Uh, we didn't see. So there's the communication from the client to the server, like sending sending command line stuff. We uh, glossed over the command lines, but we saw some of their JSON documentation, um, and we saw I think. 
implementations of what some of those functions actually do. Um, we didn't really see any of the communication of the, from the client to the server. That's presumably in files like socket.c, which I uh, mostly just glossed over. Uh, there doesn't seem to be... Um, I'm not sure like if it's sending opcodes. I think I, we saw something about opcodes, right? Let's look for opcodes. Module serialized value sub opcodes. Um, take another quick look at these. Select DB, resize DB, aux. What about pop? What about LPOP? Let's see if we can find LPOP. We've got the LPOP command, which is going to call pop generic command on C with list head. We've got the LPOP.json, which is going to describe the command. We've got server.h, this just looks like declaration. We've got some tests. We didn't look at server.c, did we? Maybe that's what I'm missing. This should be the server. Um, I'm going to have to go in a few minutes. Um, let's take a look at the symbols, the server. We have things like whether shutdown is initiated, finish shutdown, is ready to shut down. Um, plus time, maybe microsecond time, millisecond time, exit from child, dict vanilla free, object destructors, yeah, so I think that this is the missing, the stuff that I felt intuitively like like we haven't seen yet. Um, that said, now that we know where it is, I think a lot of it is going to be straightforward. A lot of it's going to be similar to other stuff that we've seen. So I don't think we miss a lot by not seeing it. I just wanted to make sure that that we didn't leave with the sense of uh, there being a bunch of stuff missing that we that we couldn't account for. Um, lookup command might be interesting, although it's just calling out the lookup command logic. Look up a command by argv and argc. I guess that's actually looking up a command as opposed to a command to look something up. All right, and so let's just do find in page lpop just to look for different things. Shared command names. Somehow this is just creating a, the command named lpop. I guess maybe that's that you can interact with that named command like by typing it. We have a key list hash table type that has unencoded Redis objects as keys and lists as values, and so on and so forth. I think that's basically it. We have two or three meshes. Okay, cool. So I'll stop there. That's Redis. That was um, definitely more involved than I thought it might be going in. There's not a lot of files, and there's not, um, and the the files that are there, they don't have. There's not like a ton of functionality the way that I, I think, for example, Postgres has a ton of functionality that um, would be overwhelming to look at it all up front. I think the, the thing that makes Redis um, a little bit complicated to read through is that so much of it is custom. Um, there are all of these different custom types of lists and, and sets and stuff. Not that they're like completely novel. Um, they are, they all seem to be variations on common sorts of um of data structures that that some of which we've seen elsewhere some of which um i'm not sure that we've seen but are but are not like you know created de novo by the by the redis people um but there is also some um some some stuff that does seem to be new like sometimes when we search for something that we found in the code we came up against uh, the, uh, the, the source of information about that kind of object was the Redis documentation. And there was like a design document that was specifying like what this data structure was doing and why it was doing it. So a lot of stuff is custom. Um, that makes it kind of challenging to, to read through just because it's, it's its own 
it's its own island in a sense. Um, and but it does seem to be everything seems to be written with an I word uh, word performance. And I'm not sure how it compares to something like, for example, memcached. Um, I know that Redis has a lot more features than than I think memcached. Um, but I don't know, for example, just in terms of raw performance, um, whether whether they're on similar plans or not. If you know, or if you have a, an opinion, let me know. But that's all for me. Thanks for watching.